And we are continuing with the ninth chapter of the Chessmen of Doom. Childermass has given up on the house, or so he wants Fergie and Johnny to think. They are going back to Dustin Heights. When they got back to Dustin Heights that evening, the professor dropped Fergie off at his house and then drove to Fillmore Street, where he and Johnny's grandparents lived. The two old people were very surprised when Johnny walked in the front door lugging his suitcase, but they were happy to see him. The professor walked in after Johnny, and he told Grandma and Grandpa Dixon a little story that he had made up on the way home. He said that the fishing had been bad and that life up in the wilds of Maine had been pretty dull, so they had decided to come home. As for the inheritance, he said that he would probably get it anyway because Perry's will was nutty and could be broken in court. After Johnny had had supper and talked with Grandpa and Grandma for a while, he went across the street and helped the professor make a sasher tort, which is a very fancy Australian chocolate layer cake. They played chess till so they were both very sleepy and ready for bed. As he climbed the stairs to his bedroom that night, Johnny was thankful that no fearsome dark shapes would be hovering by his bedside or dragging him out on nightmarish journeys. But he kept thinking about the weird chessman and the evil ruddy-faced man and Perry's insane poem, and he had a hunch that the strange sights and sounds they had seen at the old mansion were only a foretaste of worse things to come. For a time, the New England newspapers were full of the strange case of the disappearing comets. Astronomers were interviewed on radio and television, and they gave various explanations for the incredible extinguishing of the comets. Some said that the comets had been put out by the solar wind, or that they had been dying comets that just happened to go out at the same time. As usual, there were people who claimed the vanishing comets were a sign that the end of the world was near, but nobody paid much attention to them. Meanwhile, August ended and September arrived. Johnny and Fergie went back to school when the professor started teaching history again at Hagstrom College. As the days passed, Johnny saw less and less of the professor. The old man had gotten quite had gotten secretive and sullen, and he kept to himself a lot. Now and then, Johnny would glance out of his bedroom window late at night and see Dr. Coote's old blue Chevrolet parked in front of the professor's house. Dr. Charles Coote taught at the University of New Hampshire, and he was an expert on magic and the occult. Whenever the professor consulted him, Johnny knew that something was up. But what exactly was up? Johnny would have given a lot to know. One Saturday morning, to his very great surprise, Johnny looked out the parlor window and saw a black Packard coupe pulled up to the professor's pulling into the professor's driveway. The door opened and out stepped. Dr. High Gaz Malconian. Dr. Malconian was a psychiatrist with an, office, with an office in Cambridge, and Johnny had been taken to see him once when the professor thought he needed help. The doctor was a short, burly man with a silky black beard and rippling black, greasy muscle, and, and rippling black, greasy hair. As usual, he was dressed like someone getting ready to go to a wedding. Gray cutaway striped pants and a pearl gray ascot with a stick pin. As Johnny watched, Dr. Malconian ambled toward the professor's front porch, he wondered what on earth the man was doing here. Had the professor suffered a mental breakdown? Was he losing his mind? Johnny became alarmed, and he began to imagine all sorts of frightful things, like the professor being strapped into a straitjacket and hustled away into a padded van by white-coated attendants. Then it occurred to him that Dr. Melconian probably wouldn't have arrived if the professor had, had not called him, so maybe things weren't that bad after all. That afternoon, Johnny decided to make up a reason for visiting the professor. He would tell him that he had left his ring binder with the algebra notes in the professor's house. With this in mind, Johnny trot trotted across the street and climbed the front steps of the huge gray stucco house. But just as he was about to push the doorbell button, the professor stepped out. Good heavens, John Michael, he exclaimed in a voice that was a little too loud and hearty. Fancy meeting you here. Did you come over for cake or chess or just to talk? Johnny stared hard at the old man. He knew when the professor was covering something up. He always acted too jolly when he wouldn't look you straight in the eye. I just wanted to see if my ring binder was here, said Johnny. Have you seen it anywhere? The professor coughed and looked away distractedly. <clears throat> ah, no, no, I can't say that I have. Ah, you should be more careful about where you leave things. And now, if you don't mind, I have to get down to the post office before it closes. As the professor brushed past him, Johnny smiled. He knew the post office closed at noon on Saturday, and it was about half past three now. Hey, Professor, Johnny called. Was that Dr. Melconian who was here this morning? I thought it looked like his car. The professor whirled suddenly. Why, why, yes, what it was, said the professor, staring at Johnny's shoes. If you must know, he was, well, he was hypnotizing me. 
Johnny's mouth dropped open. He had expected an excuse of some kind, but not this one. Uh, how, how come you wanted to do that? Asked Johnny faintly. By now, the professor had recovered himself. He glared at Johnny. Because, my dear friend, he said, I am an old man who keeps forgetting historical facts he used to know. It's embarrassing when you don't know when the Treaty of Westphalia was signed or who was the Tsar of Bulgaria in 972 AD. So I thought I'd try to recover some of this information by having Dr. Melconian hypnotize me. Now, if you don't have any more questions, I must be off. See you later. With that, the professor turned on his heel and stalked across the grass toward his car. Johnny watched him go with a lot of confused thoughts rolling around in his mind. Slowly, he started down the steps and then trotted along the sidewalk. He stood by the curb and waved at the, he stood by the curb and waved at the professor as he drove off. Then when the old man's car was out of sight, he spun around and headed back up the walk toward the front porch. Digging his hand into his pants pocket, Johnny pulled out the door key the professor had given him. Quickly, he twisted the key in the lock and stepped into the front hall of the old house. He ran up the stairs to the professor's disorderly study. Heaps of term papers were piled on the floor, and the professor's desk was littered with cigarette ashes, paper clips, rubber bands, and pens. Flipping on the desk lamp, Johnny peered around, trying to see if the professor had left any clues as to what was going on in his mind these days. A cheap notepad lay on the desk blotter, and on it the professor had doodled flowers and butterflies and odd designs. He had also written several things. Find out who Crazy Annie is. Check burial records. Astrology. When will he try again? As Johnny read these things, he began to feel a bit smug. He had been right about the professor all along. He hadn't given up the fight against Mr. against the evil Mr. Stallybrass. He had just pretended to give in so that the boys would not be hurt. Well, said Johnny to himself, we're coming along whether he likes it or not. Snapping off the light, he marched downstairs and out the front door, locking it behind him. Then he went across the street to call on to call up Fergie. Johnny and Fergie went down to Peter's Sweet Shop, their favorite ice cream store, and their special place for plotting and planning. As they sat in a booth and slurped malteds, they figured out what they were going to do. They would keep a very close watch on the professor. As soon as Johnny saw that Dr. Coote's car was at the old man's house, he would call up Fergie and the two of them would sneak in the professor's house through a cellar window. They would take the back stairs up to the third floor and hide in one of the unused rooms above the professor's study so they could listen in on the conversation of the two old men of the two old men through the hot air register. Johnny had found out some time ago that the hot air vents in old houses made a perfect listening tube. As long as the vents were open, and they would be on a chilly September night, the two boys would be able to eavesdrop. After that, well, after that, they didn't know what, they were, what was going to happen. For all they knew, the nasty Mr. Stallybrass was doing his dirty work up at the estate right now. Each night before he went to bed, Johnny looked up at the sky. If everything seemed normal, he always heaved a sigh of relief, but he felt in his heart they were living on borrowed time. How long did they have? And that's the end of chapter nine.